The city of Charlotte is still a city in shock. Two women are dead, victims of an unknown suspect. Four victims in three weeks, all young black women. We were desperate. We were more than desperate. And then the thought came. Hey, hi, hello. My name is Rebecca Joy, and on Sundays, I sit down and talk about spooky stories, whether that's true crime or conspiracies or paranormal things. Anything spooky goes. So today will be my first installment of the series, and I would like to talk about a serial killer that I had actually never heard of, despite him being active in the city that I live in, and also being arrested on my birthday. He was known as America's first captured African American serial killer, and his name was Henry Louis Wallace. This is such a crazy case, and it's insane that he got away with so much for so long, because he knew all of his victims, and nobody put two and two together somehow. So, like all good stories, we are going to start at the beginning. On November 4th, 1965, Henry Louis Wallace was born to Lottie Mae Wallace in Barnwell, South Carolina. Now, the father was not in the picture. Lottie Mae had had an affair with a local school teacher, and once Henry was born, he dipped out. Henry and his sister grew up together along with their mom and their grandmother in a really awful home. It was made out of cinder blocks. There was no plumbing. There was not even an indoor bathroom. Barnwell is a really small town. I think there's, at the time, was less than 5,000 people living there. And being a small rural town, there was not much wealth. Over the years of being left alone by men, his mother slowly grew to hate men and really didn't treat Henry very well. She would constantly degrade him, she would beat him, and when she was too tired to beat him, she would make him and his sister Yvonne go out into the yard, cut their own switches, which is basically a little stick, and she would make them beat each other, which is just, not only did she physically abuse them, she emotionally and mentally abused them. Because they were poor, his mother often couldn't afford to buy him clothes, so she just made him wear Yvonne's hand-me-downs. So imagine growing up being forced to wear clothes of the opposite sex, probably being bullied in school. Overall, it just wasn't the best situation. However, everybody said he was a really sweet kid. He was not the smartest in the box, but he tried really, really hard. In the early 80s, he's in high school and he's really popular. His mom wouldn't let him join the football team, so he instead joined the cheerleading team. And all the girls on the squad were like, he's so sweet, he takes care of us, he would never do anything to hurt us. And he was just really well liked, especially by females. In 1983, Henry graduates and becomes a local radio station DJ, calling himself the Night Rider. Apparently he had a really smooth voice and he worked the night shift, so cool beats. He also attended two different colleges, both of which he failed out of because he just didn't care about college. He was like so into his DJ job, but it came to a quick close because he got caught stealing CDs. So they were like, sorry, man, you're out of here. You can't be here. We don't like you anymore. So at that point he's like, well, what do I do? Let's join the Navy. So he joins the Navy and he starts training to be a weapons technician on the USS Nimitz. In 1985, he marries his high school sweetheart, Moretta, and essentially becomes a stepfather to her child. He really wanted to give her child a good upbringing and let her have a good life, something that he never had with his abusive mom. However, as he's traveling around the world, stationed at different ports with the Navy, he starts to get into drugs, especially cocaine. The 80s 
was a huge time for cocaine, so he's out there traveling the world, literally trying cocaine from so many different countries, and he's having a blast! Great old time! He ends up getting caught for burglarizing a hardware store while he's stationed in Washington, and he goes to jail for 38 days and is put onto two years of parole. He never goes to any of his parole meetings, but somehow they just let that slide. It's fine. Nobody cares. The Navy finds out about this and they too let him go. Because he had a near perfect service record, the Navy actually let him off with an honorable discharge. Around this time, his wife realizes she's over it. She doesn't want to be with this person anymore. He's becoming addicted to drugs. He's been stealing. He's getting arrested. She can't put herself and her daughter in that situation anymore. So she leaves. This really takes a toll on his mental health. He had been in the Navy doing so well. He was married. He was starting a family and it all came crashing down essentially because of drugs. So He's trying to get a fresh start. He actually goes back to Barnwell or a city right outside of Barnwell called Martin. And he starts a job as a chemical operations manager at Sandoz Chemical Company. So he works there for a few years from May of 1889 to October of 1990. Little did anybody know that during this time he committed his first murder. He was actually not ever convicted of this murder, but he later on in his trial did confess that he was the one that killed Tashonda Bethia. In early 1990, a body was found dumped in the lake outside of Barnwell, South Carolina by a couple of fishermen. Around the same time, a 16 year old girl had come forward saying that she had been sexually assaulted at gunpoint. As I've said before, Barnwell is a very small town. So their police force wasn't this big, magnificent thing. They did question Henry, but they deduced that he didn't kill the girl and for the attempted rape, he was only going to be put into a program for non-violent offenders. Again, he's getting away with some stuff here because I don't know about you, but an attempted sexual assault at gunpoint is not non-violent. That's horrifying, especially for a 16 year old girl. Just ugh, what a horrible person. So he gets away with it. About a year later, he breaks into his old radio station where he used to DJ. He steals a bunch of their equipment, some CDs, and gets caught trying to pawn them for drugs. Why not? He ends up serving four months in prison for this. After his little prison stint, he gets out and he's like, you know what? I need a fresh start. I need to leave the city. Everybody knows me here. I can't get a job. So he moves to Rock Hill, South Carolina to live with his sister, Yvonne. So Rock Hill is right underneath Charlotte. And from a lot of parts in the city, it takes maybe 15, 20 minutes to get into Rock Hill. So in the couple of months that he's living with his sister, he starts to get acquainted with the city of Charlotte because it is so close. At the time, Charlotte was Poppin'. It was an up and coming city. It was the place to be. There was a relatively low crime rate up until the early 90s. And he was like, hey, so many people are moving here. There's so many job opportunities for me. And it houses my favorite basketball team, the Charlotte Hornets. Henry ends up moving out to East Charlotte on Central Avenue. And he also gets a job at Bojangles on Central Avenue. Central Avenue is a central part of this story today because almost every murder took place on or very close to Central Avenue. Almost all of the victims worked on Central Avenue or had at one point worked on Central Avenue. So again, you'd think somebody would have figured this out sooner. They did. While working at Bojangles, he meets his girlfriend, Sadie. They fall head over heels for each other and everything's going really well. Sadie thinks he's just the sweetest guy. He's very kind and respectful and is always there to take care of her and listen to her when she needs somebody to talk to. On May 27th, 1992, a girl by the name of Sharon Nance goes out to party with her friends. She was super excited. She told her aunt, hey, I'm gonna go out and party. I got this really cute little black dress 
and it's gonna be a great night. I will be back by tomorrow. Well, tomorrow comes and she's not home. Her aunt can't get a hold of her. Nobody has heard from her and they all fear for the worst. About a week later, her aunt sees on television that a body was found by some railroad tracks. Sharon's aunt, who was still searching for Sharon, went to the police station. She was able to identify Sharon's body based off of the little black dress that Sharon had been so excited to wear. No charges were ever formally pressed and the case went cold. Less than two months later, on June 15th, 1992, Caroline Love is leaving her job at Bojangles to go home and do some laundry. Before she leaves, she asks her manager for a roll of quarters in exchange for a $10 bill so she can do her laundry because she didn't have laundry in her apartment. It was a little bit down the street. Now, her apartment was on Central Avenue and she had a roommate. And her roommate was none other than Sadie, Henry's girlfriend. So Henry was very familiar with who Caroline was the three of them would sometimes hang out when he came over to her house. So on this particular night, her cousin had dropped her off at home, watched her walk inside, and then left to go home himself. Two days later, her boss at Bojangles called her sister to say, hey, we haven't seen Caroline in two days. Can you check on her? We're a little bit worried because she's always on time. So her sister goes over to her apartment, knocks on the door. They can't find anyone. Sadie isn't home, Caroline isn't home, and so Kathy calls Sadie and is saying, hey, have you been home? Have you seen Caroline? I can't find her, she hasn't been to work in a few days. And Sadie is like, no, I'm staying with Henry, but I will come home right away and we can figure this out. Kathy, Sadie, and Henry all meet at the apartment, looking around, trying to find out where she went and what happened to her. They notice a lot of the furniture is out of place and that the sheets are gone from her bed. So all three of them, Henry included, go to the police station to report her missing. She is never found and the case goes cold. So I apologize for the change in lighting. My full-time job is a piano teacher and I had a few lessons to teach and now it has become dark outside. So it's February 19th, 1993. Shauna Hawk did not return home from her job at Taco Bell, where she used to work for Henry. Now her mom thought that was a little weird because she left her coat and her purse in the house, but her car was gone. February in Charlotte is really, really cold. It's probably one of the coldest months out of the entire year. And so something just wasn't adding up. Worried, she calls her boyfriend, Daryl, and asks if he had seen Shauna. He said he hadn't. And in the middle of the phone call, she gets another call from a friend saying that Shauna didn't pick up her godson from school that day. So the mother calls Daryl back and says, you have to come over right away. I'm freaking out. I don't know what's going on. I can't find her. Nobody has heard from her all day. Daryl comes over. He sits the mother down on the couch and says, look, calm down. We'll figure this out. If we can't figure it out, we'll call 911. As the mom is calming down, Daryl starts walking around the apartment looking to see if he can find any clues. When he gets to the bathroom, he notices that instead of the shower curtain being tucked inside of the tub so the water can't get out, it's on the outside of the tub. Finding this weird, he opens it up and he finds Shauna's body strangled, beaten, and submerged in water. There was no evidence because she had been submerged in water and the case went cold. A few days later, Henry and several of their friends at Taco Bell attend Shauna's funeral. Four months later, in June of 1993, Audrey Spain is working at her new Taco Bell location on Wendover Road. Previously, she had worked for Henry at Taco Bell on Central Avenue but she moved because this other Taco Bell was closer to her home. As she's working at this Taco Bell, she gets really close with the manager there. His name is Mark Lawrence. And on June 22nd, she doesn't show up for work. Mark is very concerned because she was consistently on time and it would have been unlike her to not at least call him because of their close relationship. 
Later that day, he drives by her apartment and sees her car there, knocks on the door, she doesn't answer, so he ends up calling her and leaving her a voicemail. She doesn't show up for work again the next day. Again, he drives by, sees her car, knocks, gets no answer. He had tried to contact some of her family members but hadn't heard back yet, so he called 911. The statement from the police says that they would send police officers periodically to knock on the door, which they did, and they got no answer. But Mark felt like that just wasn't enough. He thought his friend was in danger, and the police weren't really doing enough. So he goes to the apartments and talks to the maintenance crew. Now, the maintenance crew generally always have a key to every apartment. That's how they get in and do what they need to do. So they enter the apartment through her sliding door, and when they do, they find her body sexually assaulted and strangled. Police find no fingerprints, no evidence at all of a break-in, and the case goes cold. Less than two months later, on August 9th, Valencia Jumper invites her friend Zachary over to hang out. They plan to meet after midnight because Valencia was a paralegal student at the local college and she then had a shift at Food Lion on Central Avenue after work. Zachary arrives at her apartment early in the morning on August 10th and finds smoke pouring out of the windows and under the door. He is unable to enter the apartment and so he runs to a neighbor's house to call 911. Remember, this is the 90s and nobody has cell phones, so he had to knock on several doors before waking somebody up to use their phone. The fire department arrives and puts out the fire, and as they do so, they find Valencia's body in her bedroom, completely charred. The chief fire officer deduced that it had been caused by a pot of beans burning on the stove, which then ignited the entire apartment. When her autopsy was performed, the medical examiner noted that there was no soot or carbon monoxide in her lungs or body, but he still marked it as death from thermal burns. At the time, this case was its own case. It was in no way related to Henry at all, besides the fact that Henry and Yvonne were extremely close friends with Valencia. Both of them attend her funeral. One month later, on September 15th, 1993, Michelle Stinson heads home from her shift at Taco Bell, where she worked with Henry. She had two sons at home, a one-year-old and a three-year-old, and she worked at Taco Bell to help pay the bill. Later on, her friend James came to visit her and knocked on the door but got no answer. He did, however, hear her children in the apartment and knocked again no answer. As he turns to leave, he hears the oldest of the two kids saying, Mommy is sleeping on the floor. At that point, the child ran through the back door up to James and is tugging on him, saying, Mommy's sleeping on the floor. Mommy's sleeping on the floor. She won't wake up. He enters the apartment and finds Michelle Stinson in a pool of blood in the kitchen. She had been stabbed and strangled with a phone cord, which had been cut out of the wall. Because the phone cord was cut out of the wall, he was unable to call 911, and he had to walk around to other neighboring apartments knocking on doors to find a phone just to call 911. There were no fingerprints, no evidence of a break-in, and the case goes cold. Five months goes by. It's now February 20th, 1994, and Vanessa Mack returns home from her shift at the Carolina Medical Center. She calls her sister, they chat, they talk about her ex-boyfriend Henry who worked at Taco Bell with her sister. She and her two young daughters went and got ready for bed. The next morning was Sunday morning and every Sunday morning she had a shift at the medical center so her mom would come over and babysit her four-month-old and seven-year-old. Now, on this particular day, she arrives, and the door is partially ajar. She enters the apartment and finds the four-month-old laying by herself on the couch, 
And four months is very young. A four month old should not be left alone. Her mom is naturally very worried, picks up the child and starts walking through the apartment. When she gets to the bedroom, she opens the door and sees Vanessa's feet hanging out from under the covers. Vanessa was pronounced dead at the scene, having been sexually assaulted and strangled. Like all of the cases before, there was no fingerprints, no evidence of a break-in, and the case went cold. So amidst all of this, Henry is still working at Taco Bell on Central, his girlfriend Sadie is still working at Bojangles, and Sadie's becoming really good friends with these three girls named Brandy, Betty, and Deborah. Now, she introduces them to Henry, and Henry actually ends up becoming really good friends with Brandy's boyfriend. Less than two weeks later, on March 8th, 1994, Betty Jean Balcom doesn't show up for her shift at Bojangles. The manager, who had dealt with this before, immediately calls her family. They had not seen her, and the next day, an anonymous call is made to the police revealing her body in an apartment complex. She had been beaten, sexually assaulted, and strangled. During the investigation, they found no fingerprints, no evidence, but her car was missing. So they were hoping that as soon as they could find that car, they would get some answers. Betty's friend Brandy and her boyfriend Lamar, who was Henry's friend, were both really concerned about this murder, not only because they were co-workers at Bojangles, but because they were all neighbors. So this really hit home for her and she was extremely worried. The next day she had a doctor's appointment, didn't want to leave her 10 month old son home alone, naturally. Her boyfriend Lamar says he will watch her son while she goes to her appointment. As Brandy is about to leave, there's a knock on the door. It's Henry, and he says he has to go out of town. He does have something of Lamar's that he'll drop by on his way out of town later. So Brandy is like, okay, sounds good. I have a doctor's appointment right now. I'll be back in a little bit. Give me a call later and we will get it figured out. Later that evening, Lamar returns home from work. He notices that the stereo and TV are gone and items are scattered everywhere. He walks through the house, he sees T.W., who is their 10-month-old son, grasping for air with a pair of bike shorts tied around his neck. He, he finds Brandy in the bedroom, assaulted and strangled. He calls 911 and his son is taken to the hospital where he does survive. Again, the police finds no evidence of a break-in, but now for the first time, they're starting to think, hmm. Maybe this is all the work of the same person, especially after these two girls on consecutive nights were murdered in the same apartment complex in the same way. They're starting to think all of these murders might be related. On the night of March 9th and March 10th, police beef up patrols in and around the surrounding area. They finally locate Betty's car, which had been abandoned in a parking lot, and they find their first clue. Everything in the car had been wiped down except one handprint on the trunk. Now, if you remember, Henry had been to prison for a short amount of time, yes, but anytime you are arrested, you are fingerprinted. So his fingerprints were in the system and they matched the handprint on Betty's car. On the night of the 10th and 11th, they begin to shake out his house. So, He's inside, surrounded by police officers. Yet on March 11th, 1994, Deborah Slaughter's mother comes to her apartment to drop something off and finds her brutally stabbed, assaulted, and strangled in her home. She had 38 stab wounds in total, three to the heart and 12 to the left lung, all of which would have been fatal. The remaining 23 were in her liver and stomach area, and all of these stab wounds were presumed to have taken place after she was strangled. Police don't have any evidence in this case, but they do assume it's Henry, and finally, on March 13th, 1994, Henry Wallace is arrested. He immediately confesses to the murder of 10 women in Charlotte, 
and accepts his fate calmly. For the next 12 hours, in extreme detail, he describes how he knew and planned to murder each of his victims. He spoke about his crack addiction and drug problem and how this led to him robbing and murdering all of these women. I will next discuss how each of the women were murdered and his recollection of each event. Henry admits to the murder of Caroline Love and leads detectives to find her body. Being a friend of his girlfriend, Henry was able to make a copy of their house key. He snuck into their house when he knew both of them were gone, and when Caroline came home and started watching TV, he came up to her and kissed her on the cheek. Naturally, she's like, what the hell? Don't do that again or I'm gonna tell Sadie. He freaks out, puts her into a chokehold, ties her hands with a curling iron, and tapes her mouth closed. He brings her to the bedroom and assaults her before forcing her to put her clothes back on and strangling her by hand. He wrapped her in her bed sheets, put her in the car, and drove her outside of town to dump her body. He then frequently checked on her body to make sure it was still hidden. He admits to stopping by Shauna Hawk's house to discuss work with her. They talk briefly and he goes to leave and get, tries to give her a hug. And as you can imagine, if your boss comes over to your house and is just like, hey, give me a hug, you're gonna be like, okay, bye. She's a little bit awkward about it. And then he's just like, let's have sex. She's like, no, I don't want to have sex with you. You're my boss. This is a terrible idea. He freaks out puts her in a chokehold, drags her to the bedroom, and assaults her. He tells detectives that she cried the entire time. He then forces her to put her clothing back on, takes her to the bathroom, strangles her with a towel, and submerges her in the bathroom. He also admits to stealing $50 from her purse for crack. Shauna's mother later goes on to found Mothers of Murdered Offspring in Charlotte, which is a nonprofit organization to help family members whose children have been murdered. I will leave all of the information for that organization down below in case you would like to check it out. Henry admits to going to visit Audrey Spain to smoke weed with her. After smoking, he asks for a cup of water, and while she turns around and reaches for the glass, he puts her in a chokehold and demands the combination for her safe at Bojangles, where she was working. She says she didn't know it and that she doesn't have any money because she just came back from a vacation. Getting angrier by the second, he continues to choke her while he assaults her. He then forces her to take a shower to wash off any evidence before getting dressed again and strangling her with her own bra. He took her car keys and credit cards to purchase gas that night and then later returned to her house to make phone calls so that if the police looked into her death, it would seem like she hadn't died on the day that she actually died. He also admitted that this was the first time he went to a girl's house with the plan of robbing and murdering them. Henry admits that Valencia Jumper did not initially die in her house fire. In fact, he and Valencia were very close and he had gone over to her house to be comforted because he and Sadie had gotten into a fight. After they talk for a little bit, he asks Valencia to call Sadie and kind of explain his side of the story because he's thinking, you know, she might listen to another woman more than she would listen to me. As she reaches for the phone, he puts her into a chokehold and drags her to the bedroom where he assaults her. He then strangles her to death with a towel and removes all of her jewelry. He sees a bottle of rum on the counter and decides, you know, let's do something different. He douses her body in alcohol, douses the hall, the floor, the kitchen, and then puts a pot of beans on the stove and lights it all up. He leaves the apartment, but returns 20 minutes later to ensure that the apartment is thoroughly on fire. When he sees flames coming out of the apartment, he feels that it's safe to go home where he gives the jewelry of his recently murdered victim to his girlfriend as an apology gift. 
Henry admits to going to Michelle Stinson's house with the intent of assaulting and murdering her. He gets right to the point and says he wants to have sex with her. She says that she can't because she doesn't want to, A. B, she's sick, and C, her son is asleep. When she says that she's sick, Henry is like, well, if you're sick, you have medicine. You had to have gone to the doctor, right? And she says, you know, I don't have medicine. I've just been taking ibuprofen. He gets really upset and he's like, well, then you're not sick. Perform oral on me. She told him that she didn't know how to and he distinctly remembers telling her, well, you're gonna learn. Rude. He then assaults and strangles her. However, she suddenly regains consciousness and at this point, he completely loses it, takes a knife from the kitchen and stabs her four times until she's dead. Because of her screams, one of her children woke up and he ends up walking the child back to bed, giving it a glass of water and saying, go back to sleep. He then uses a washcloth to wipe any fingerprints off the scene of the crime, takes the knife washcloth and throws it over her back fence and then leaves. Henry admits to calling Vanessa Mack, saying that he was in the neighborhood and he wanted to come by and hang out. However, his true intentions was to assault, rob, and murder her. He asks her a drink, and when she is turned around, he chokes her with a pillowcase that he brought from home and demands for her money, her credit cards, and the PIN numbers for her credit cards. She gives it all to him willingly, begging to be spared just for her child. He then sexually assaults her and demands she gets dressed afterwards before strangling her with the pillowcase he brought from home. Before leaving, he goes into the child's room and rocks it back to sleep. Later on, he tries to use her debit cards. However, the pin number she gave him was wrong. Good for her. Henry goes to Betty Jean Balcom's house, saying that he needed to use her phone. And while he used her phone, would she please get him a drink? However, when her back is turned, he places her in a chokehold and tells her this is a robbery, asking for the alarm codes, safe combinations, and anything else needed to rob the Bojangles that she worked at. He claims that she was very upset and kept asking, why are you doing this to me? He simply told her that he was a very sick person and that he had hurt many people. In an attempt to humanize him, she says that she would forgive him and she gives him a hug. However, this enrages him even further and he forces her to perform oral sex. She pretends to give him oral sex, however, instead she pulls and scratches and bites at his penis. He then first strangles her and assaults her. He steals her TV, her stereo, and her gold necklace. He uses her own car to take these to a pawn shop, sell them, and then comes back to just double check that he had killed her. He later dumps her car in an abandoned parking lot, but forgets to wipe the trunk. So as I said before, this was what ultimately led to his capture. Henry claims that he had wanted to kill Brandy the same night that he killed Betty. However, Brandy's boyfriend, his friend, Lamar, had been home, so he decided to go on and do it the next day. If you remember, Henry had gone over it and told them he was going to be leaving town and that later on he would drop something off. When he goes to drop it off, he asks Brandy for a drink, and yet again, while her back is turned, he puts her into a chokehold. He asks for all the money in the house. She says that all they have is a Pringles can that had about $20 in change in it. He takes her to the bedroom and says that he is about to assault her. At this point, he hears her 10-month-old crying, goes into his bedroom, gives him a pacifier, and then picks him up and brings him to Brandy. This is probably the worst part of the story that I read. He proceeds to force her to hold her son while he sexually assaults her, strangles her with a pillowcase, and attempts to strangle her son. He lays her son next to her dead body before leaving. On the way out the door, he stole the stereo, the TV, the Pringles can, and also some food that had 
just been delivered because he wanted to eat that later. He says that he sold the TV and the stereo for $175, spent it all on crack, and used it almost all in that next two days. At this point, Henry knew that the cops were onto him and it was about to be all over. So he decides to go out with a bang. He admits to going over to Deborah Slaughter's house to do drugs and also try to sell her drugs. She said she didn't want to buy any drugs because she needed to make her money last throughout the entire week. But when she said that, he realized that she definitely did have money and he would rob her. Once again, he asks for a cup of water. She turns to grab it and he puts her into a chokehold. At this moment, she screams out, you're the one, you're the one that's been killing everyone. He says, yep, it's me. And now I'm gonna do the same to you. He demands that she take off her clothes and give him oral. And she says, well, you might as well kill me because I don't do that. Becoming more and more enraged, he strangles her and then sexually assaults her. Because they were friends, he knew that she had a knife in her purse at all times. So he finds her purse, grabs the knife, and proceeds to stab her 38 times to ensure that she was dead. She had already been strangled and then assaulted and then stabbed. It was a horrific scene and he ends it by stealing $40 from her purse, leaving the house to buy some crack, and then returns back to the home to smoke said crack next to her dead body. The very next day, Henry was arrested, taken to jail, and that is where he stayed for the next two or so years until September 1996, where his trial began. So the trial took almost the trial took almost two and a half years to start because the courthouse had to change venues at one point. They were having some problems with the jury selection process and also and there were some issues with the DNA evidence from some of the victims. So on January 7th, 1997, the jury found Henry Wallace guilty of the following. I'm just going to read these out because there's quite a bit. He's guilty of nine counts of first-degree murder, each on the basis of malice, premeditation, and deliberation, and under the felony murder rule. In addition, the jury found the defendant guilty of eight counts of first-degree rape, one count of second-degree rape, two counts of first-degree sexual offense, two counts of second-degree sexual offense, one count of assault with a deadly weapon, one count of an assault on a child under the age of 12, and five counts of robbery with a dangerous weapon. Later in the month, on January 29th, it was decided that he would be sentenced to death, and he, has, and he has been in prison in Raleigh, North Carolina ever since. I get to read too deep into it, but there was some ruling in the early 2000s that put death row on pause, basically, in North Carolina, so he's kind of just there indefinitely. He's tried to appeal his case multiple times, and of course the judge has denied it every single time. And so there he sits, just waiting to die. On June 5th of 1998, Henry actually ends up marrying a nurse that worked in the prison, which is just weird. She ended up quitting after they get married, for obvious reasons. But the weirdest part is that they get married in the room next to the chamber in which he is scheduled to die in. It's just a morbid ending to a morbid story. And honestly, I think it's what he deserves. So I know this was a long and difficult case to listen to. I hope my infographic helped understand how everybody was connected in this case and how the police just truly dropped the ball. They really, really screwed up here. A lot of the people living in Charlotte claimed that it was because all of the victims were young black women living in a bad part of town and they just didn't care. The police says, you know, it was the drug war. Lots of stuff was happening. Murders in Charlotte had doubled that year, which is true. However, 
the murders that were being focused on were not the murders of young black women. And so most of the city was pissed. I mean, would you not be pissed if you find out that everybody had known each other and the police didn't even start putting together the dots until six victims down the line? It's just, it honestly just makes my blood boil. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comment section down below. And pretty, pretty please subscribe and like this video so that I know I should keep doing this type of thing. I had a lot of fun doing it despite the darkness of the subject matter. And I learned a lot of stuff about the city that I live in that I did not know before. I hope all of you have a fantastic day and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.